London news agents. This is the editor's letter that has gone out to Daily Telegraph readers uh, today. It says, Dear Reader, Donald Trump has warned that we're on the brink of World War III after a drone attack on a base in Jordan killed three US troops. But how would everyday British life change in a global conflict? And then it goes, P.S. For only one pound, you, un- you can unlock four months of access. If it's going to be World War Three. <laughs> will we need Waste four months? <laughs> Waste the money. Yeah. Um, the editor sent Colin Freeman, one of the reporters, out to investigate how everyday British life would change in the event of World War Three. What I love about this is... It sounds as if the Telegraph's trying to get ahead of the story. We don't want to miss this. It would be terrible if World War Three happened and we'd miss the story. So today we're just going to deconstruct why everyone is starting to talk about World War Three in these vaguely apocalyptic terms and whether we have reached a turning point in the geopolitics of what is going on in the world right now. Welcome to the news agents. It's John. It's Emily. And you are sounding unusually husky, dare I say it. And I think you've got something wrong with your kind of voice box at the moment and you need to take it gently. Is that correct? I've been on um, voice rest for three days, having been diagnosed with bruised vocal cords, which has been such a treat. Who bruised them? I know. (laughs) I think probably me. I think it was probably the newsagent singing. Um... Anyway, there you go. It's been sort of three days of no speaking like a Trappist monk. So I'm just coming back into the fold. I I don't wish to be unkind or cast out even, but the idea of you not speaking for three days is something that I cannot get my head around. Anyway, we will leave that and talk about... Let's go from your bruised vocal cords to the potential for World War III because that's the obvious segue to make. Um... Look, I think that some of this is kind of borderline hysterical when you have people saying it's World War Three. It's already started, you know, and kind of articles about how life is going to change for you if you're going to be spending the next three months in a nuclear bunker. Well, it's going to change quite profoundly, actually. But equally, there is no doubt that it does feel like a really dangerous, precarious moment that we are living through at the moment because there seem to be so many kind of it's a hydra-headed monster that you've got in the middle east at the moment you've got the situation in gaza you've got the situation with the houthis you've now got this attack where three u.s servicemen die in jordan near the syrian border and what the consequences of that will be you've got the sort of puppet master of iran seemingly controlling a number of different militant groups but how much do they control them and it all adds to this sense of peril of what might happen next. Yeah, and I think one of the reasons that people are talking about it in sort of World War Three terms is not just because it feels like a nuclear apocalypse is imminent, but because we are constantly trying to work out what the trigger points are for any major conflict. Was it the Hamas invasion on October the 7th? Has that actually taken us already into a new place? Was it Iran's involvement, what looks like Iran's involvement, killing three US troops? It's the first time that US troops have been killed in an attack in the Middle East since the Israel-Hamas war began in Gaza. And I guess there is a sense that people, you know, sort of telegraph readers or, or the editor aside, They don't want to feel that somehow the tenor of this conflict has changed and we haven't really caught up with where we are. And I think what has happened overnight, over the weekend, is a sense that America has to react in some way now. America has always been, don't forget, the supporter of Israel or the broker in the Middle East. Now it looks as if it may have to become a player because there is pressure on President Biden now, particularly from Republicans, we should say, to act. And what does acting, what does retaliation actually look like? I think what's interesting about that framing is that if America didn't do anything, that would still be a policy decision, just as much as doing something is a policy decision. And very early on, after October the 7th, when there was a fear that this could escalate and escalate fast. And if you remember, in the days 
and first couple of weeks afterwards, people were thinking, oh, my God, is Hezbollah about to attack? Is Are the Iranians about to get involved? What about the Houthis dramatically stepping up? And there has been sort of low level skirmishing on a quite controlled basis across the Israel-Lebanon border involving Hezbollah, involving the Houthis trying to fire on shipping uh, in the Red Sea. And America sent two carrier groups to the eastern Mediterranean, along with a nuclear powered submarine. Normally, America never talks about where its nuclear submarines are, but they said that there was a nuclear powered submarine in the region in theater. And I think America was keen to, to quote Teddy Roosevelt, carry a big stick but continue to speak softly. Yeah. And I think the question now is, is it going to have to speak a little more loudly as a result of three American servicemen having lost their lives and dozens more being injured in this drone attack? And that is why it just feels like, while it was kind of simmering and manageable, you get American servicemen dead and you start to think, ooh, is it about to boil over? Yeah, Iran, we should say, has tried to distance itself from the attacks on US servicemen by saying that it has no connection to them and the clashes are between the US Army and, if you like, other resistance groups in the region who, you know, do from time to time confront each other. Now, you can see that in whichever way you want. Either Iran is a player and doesn't want it to be known to America or else Iran is kind of pulling the puppet strings but isn't directly telling the militant groups what to do or else it is actually trying to provoke the US into something that demands more action over the Israel-Gaza situation. Well, let's speak now to the political analyst Jasmine El Gamal. Her qualifications are that she was a former Middle East advisor at the Pentagon during the Obama administration, so understands well the sort of decision-making nightmares that Biden now has ahead of him. Jasmine, it's great to have you with us. It's tempting to say, how close are we to World War Three? But I mean, it's a tense moment, but are we overdoing it? Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me on. And absolutely, I mean, I would say tense is an understatement. Obviously, this has multiple aspects that I think we should touch upon, right? I mean, not least of which is the absolute tragic loss of life of these three U.S. soldiers and those who are injured. Regardless of the politics, this was just a horrible thing that happened. When we talk about the second and third aspects, I want to sort of differentiate between tactics and strategy. And I know that might sound boring to some people, but really, I mean, these are two very distinct things, but equally important that the U.S., thinks about when something like this happens. When we talk about tactics, we have to think about, okay, what do we do now? How do we respond to this? And that's what you're going to be hearing a lot of debate about over the next 24 hours, I would say. Retaliation is almost 100% sure to happen. I find it impossible uh, to believe, and certainly the U.S. has said that it will retaliate and it will do whatever it has to do to protect its troops. So the question is really how. How do you retaliate against something so serious and so grave like this without making a really sensitive situation even more combustible. Those are the questions that the administration and is going to be thinking about right now. And of course, hand in glove with that goes the broader strategic question. Okay, if we retaliate, what happens next and how does that fit into the broader policy of the US in the region? Where does Gaza fit into this? Do we bring it in at all? Is what's happening in Gaza related to what's happening now? So far, the Biden administration has been really decoupling those two things, saying what's happening in Gaza is one thing, this is something completely different. Whereas those in the region are all saying, pay attention, this is happening because of what's happening in Gaza. Do a ceasefire and this will stop. So those are just some of the things that the Biden team are going to be talking about over the next several hours. And Jasmine, you work very closely with President Obama um, as Middle East advisor, if you were now advising Biden, who presumably you know or at least understand quite well, what would you be telling him on both tactics and strategies you've outlined? 
Great question and a really tough one. So I worked with the Secretary of Defense's team and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And I was constantly in meetings with them as the debate was happening over whether and how the U.S. should get involved in Syria, if you'll remember that. It was around 2012, 2013, 2014, exactly. And I would, I, I very much was always aligned with the chairman at the time, Chairman Dempsey. I had great respect for him. And he was always thinking about what happens next and how does this fit into our strategy? And also, if we are going to be putting U.S. troops at risk, I mean, remember at the end of the day, the president and the secretary of defense of the United States, their first and foremost obligation is to U.S. personnel and the American people. So if you're going to be putting U.S. troops in harm's way, what are you doing it for? What I would say right now, if I were in these meetings, was the same thing I was saying back then. It can't just be tactical. Tactical doesn't work. We've seen it time and again when it comes to U.S. policy in the Middle East. You have to have a broader strategy that allows for an off-ramp to allow for a de-escalation and to go to addressing the root causes of why all of these attacks are happening in the first place. Address the Palestinian question, address the presence of apparently permanent presence of the U.S. in the region, look at what we're doing, why we're doing it, and let's work backwards from there. Now, unfortunately, those discussions are probably not going to be happening now. This is a serious situation. U.S. troops have just been killed and the U.S. is going to have to respond. So he should call for a ceasefire is what you're saying, but he can't. Well, for multiple reasons, of course, the U.S. should be calling for a ceasefire. I mean, the U.S. support for Israeli actions in Gaza, the decisions the U.S. has been making, most recently cutting off this funding for UNRWA, which provides life-saving services to Palestinians at this critical time in Gaza. I mean, these are all things that I would uh, certainly not be advising the U.S. president to be doing right now to promote sustainable peace in the region. Jasmine, the way you have framed the whole conversation so far is about the Middle East region, understandably. Yeah. Is there also a domestic consideration in all of this as well? Donald Trump has said, We've got World War Three starting because Biden is so weak. There is domestic public opinion. It is an election year. Is Biden also going to be calculating how this plays out domestically as well as how it plays out in the region? And the two might give you different answers. Absolutely. I mean, no doubt the president is living his worst nightmare right now. I mean, to be dragged into or being seen as being dragged into another war in the Middle East. You know, I don't have to tell you how tired the American public is of sending their troops to the Middle East, hearing about troops dying in the Middle East. I mean, you will have people asking these hard questions of the president. Why are more U.S. troops dying in the Middle East yet again? What are we doing there? You said this wouldn't happen. You ran on the platform. You said that there would be no more war. Why is this happening? We need answers from you. And people are going to be holding him accountable for that. Of course, you have another side, which is going to be doing the opposite. The Senator Lindsey Graham saying, we have to be strong. We can't let them walk all over us. We have to retaliate. In fact, we have to retaliate right where the source is, you know, Iran, Iran, Iran. So the president is going to have a really difficult time, I think, trying to continue to project American strength while at the same time explaining why he is putting U.S. troops at risk at this really critical moment domestically. And Jasmine, when you hear, as we have done from Iran today, saying actually it wasn't behind this, it's distanced itself from the attack that killed the U.S. soldiers, is your response A, I don't believe that, that's simply a lie? Is it B, it was a mistake and they're regretting it? And do you start to kind of look at this as a potential turning point. I mean, we're always drawn back to the, if you like, the sort of the Franz Ferdinand moment of World War mm. One. Do you have any sense of whether this becomes a trigger or a big enough yeah. trigger? 
Iran has always said that it does not want a war with the United States, or for that matter, Israel, because it knows that that means the United States as well. For its part, the U.S. doesn't want a war with Iran either. Now, normally, the, so there's no doubt that Iran funds these groups, Iran provides training. I mean, it, that, that's not in question. What is in question is just how much Iran directs these attacks. So whether it's the Houthis, Hezbollah, Hamas, or these militias in Syria and Iraq, how much is Iran actually saying, hey, go do this, go kill these soldiers? Anyone who tells you they know the answer to that is bluffing. We don't know just how much control it has over the direction. But we do know that it uses these groups as a way to pump up its leverage so that eventually when it does talk to the U.S. about bigger issues like nuclear program and other issues, that it comes to the table with some sort of leverage face to face with the U.S. So I would just leave that there, but obviously much more to talk about when it comes to that topic. I just appreciate it so much. Thank you so thank much you. for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. That was Jasmine Al-Kamel, right in the Pentagon, in the Obama administration. You're now going to hear what will effectively be a very different set of solutions or responses. And this is coming from a former ambassador who used to work for George Bush. So let's speak now to John Herbst. Uh, he's the director of the Eurasia Centre at the Atlantic Council, former US ambassador to Ukraine and Uzbekistan, and also served as the US Consul General uh, in Jerusalem. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, when you hear people talking, as Donald Trump has done, about this is the start of World War Three or that World War Three has already started, is that overheated? It's certainly overheated. And of course, coming from um, former President Trump, um, it seems like something of a scare tactic. Uh, but it is true that we face the greatest threat to global stability, I would say to American interests, since the end of the Cold War, because you have two large predatory powers uh, who are growing increasingly active, and the West has been slow to recognize the danger. Sorry, when you talk about those two big powers, do you mean Russia and China? Do you mean Russia and Iran? Or do you mean China and Iran, just to clarify? I'm talking in the first instance about Russia and China because they're the only ones who can actually uh, pose an existential threat to the United States and more broadly to the West. But um, Iran is a secondary predatory power, North Korea as well. And then there are little predatory powers, uh, whether you're talking about the Houthis, uh, Hamas and others. And in terms of what has happened in Jordan over the weekend, this attack which we think was instigated, if not carried out, on behalf of Iran, is this about the Israel-Gaza war, or is this about something, dare I say, even bigger or even more long-term? This is a little bit, or somewhat, about the war in, in Gaza and Israel. Uh, that's the pretext, certainly, for Iranian misbehavior here and Houthi misbehavior here. But we need to understand that Russia, China, Iran are partners, that uh, we saw the support, the diplomatic support that Russia gave to Hamas within days of its assault on Israel. Uh, we know that the Houthis are agents of the Iranians and would not be able to launch missiles and to board ships without substantial supply and training from Iran. And they are trying to weaken the United States. They're trying to weaken our partners and allies, in this case, in the Middle East. And of course, we play to that by being very timid in the face of over 150 uh, Iranian-backed attacked attacks on American soldiers in the Middle East. And who knows how many now Houthi missile attacks on international ships, including American warships in the Red Sea. So when you talk about timidity, what are you saying in terms of what the US response should be? The United States should have struck back immediately after the first attack on American soldiers, what, two months ago? Instead, 
you had senior American officials say, we don't want escalation. That is a signal to nasty powers that we are weak, that we are afraid of escalation, as opposed to making them afraid of escalation. The former Pentagon Middle East advisor that we just spoke to framed it slightly differently and said, actually, if President Biden had been more prepared to call for a ceasefire on Israel over the Gaza war, then perhaps that would have been the de-escalation. That's a very naive analysis. Uh, There's no question that Iran pursues aggressive policies in the Middle East. And if Iran says, well, this is happening, or others say this is happening because of Israel responding to an unprovoked assault in which over 1,200 people were murdered, uh, all you're doing is signaling to people who believe aggression is a way of getting their, achieving their aims that aggression works. I was speaking to current American diplomats uh, who are serving in the State Department at the moment uh, right. the other day and they were saying actually the remarkable thing about this conflict so far is that there's only one superpower involved and that is the US. It is remarkable the extent to which China and Russia are absent from all that is unfolding in the Middle East and that people are still looking to America to be the big player in the region. Boy I wish that were true. I think that's also naive thinking. Uh, it wasn't an accident that Hamas showed up in Moscow two or three days after the unpleasantness began in October. It's not an accident that that attack occurred uh, because the Hamas was receiving weapons and training from Iran. It's not an accident that the Russians are providing diplomatic cover for Hamas at the UN. All of these things are linked. And to avert one's eyes from the role the Kremlin plays here is naivete. It serves no interest. It just tells Putin that the West wants to delude itself, that Washington wants to delude itself. Ambassador Herbst, let me just try and understand what um, you're suggesting. Do you think that Putin was an active player in the Hamas attacks? Do you believe there was coordination between Iran and Russia? Because I've definitely, you know, tried that theory on multiple analysts who say that's complete garbage. Um, I didn't say that, did I? No, that's I'm just trying to get clarification. What what, what, what I said was that they, they act together in a general direction. Whether or not Hamas cleared this with Moscow, whether or not Hamas cleared the exact reparations for that assault with Iran, I don't know. I know that Iran enabled it. And I know that Moscow has provided diplomatic support for Hamas. And I know that Moscow and Iran work closely together on arms. We know that the Iranian drones are killing Ukrainians. We know that Iran is asking for uh, Russian weapons in, in response. We're hearing about perhaps SU-35s winding up in Iranian hands. They are acting in concert. And again, not to pay attention to that is to miss the main game. So what happens now? Well, I think Biden has to respond with some strength because now American soldiers are dead. We get you know, the attack in, in Jordan. But if the old pattern holds, it will be an attack on some base or something of some Iranian proxy. I think uh, costs need to be imposed on Iran for what its proxies do. But what does that mean? What does that mean in practical terms? I am not a military planner. I imagine that CENTCOM um, has all sorts of contingency plans. In fact, I've heard, by the way, for, for six or more weeks that senior people in CENTCOM have been very, very unhappy with the leash that the White House has imposed on them and letting American soldiers be attacked with impunity. Uh, now, we, I'm not a huge fan of the foreign policy of Donald Trump, but he took out Soleimani. You're referring to the killing of Qasim Soleimani um, by US drone strike in 2020 under the Trump administration. That was a bold and a proper move. Something on the order of that uh, need not be that. It depends upon what targets are available, how we can strike efficiently. But some cost that needs to be imposed on Iran. That's how we might be able to shut down 
the constant Houthi attacks on shipping, which are causing a major, major uh, penalty, uh, tax penalty, you might say, on consumers worldwide, as well as might stop the assault on American soldiers in the Middle East. Ambassador, thank you so much uh, for being with us. That was really interesting. Really helpful. Thank very you so helpful. much. Thank you so much. Bye bye. I thought that was really interesting for two very contrasting critiques of the way US is conducting policy in the Middle East right now. And I guess you could say maybe one liberal, the other conservative. Also, I thought interesting when he's talking about the unhappiness at CENTCOM, which is US Central Command, which is essentially the kind of nerve centre of US military uh, operations about the fact that Biden had been too weak in responding to the attacks that have come on US troops in the region in the past couple of months. Yeah, and I think those two perspectives um, broadly tell you the problem that lands on Biden's plate right now, because clearly the analyst who had worked for Obama thinks that the route to this lies through trying to forge some kind of diplomatic solution to what is going on between Israel and Hamas, or at least that is a central part of what what Biden now has to do or should have done earlier in terms of where he positioned himself vis-a-vis a a ceasefire in the Palestinian people. And you heard from Ambassador Herbst, who we should probably just put in brackets, worked formally for George Bush, George W. Bush, when he was president. And I think that is more where the Republicans, American Republicans are now, which is you got to do something, right? And so Joe Biden is sort of sitting there with this leash of how do I not look knee jerk? How do I make sure that it is a strategy, not a tactic? But how do I stop people from calling America too weak? And that is the dynamic that's going to play out because, you know, one of the things that strikes me, if you look at the UK political response to the Middle East, Keir Starmer and Rishi Sunak have been kind of, you know, very uh, cooperative. It's been very bipartisan. It's not been an issue over which they've separated and called each other names. In the American political framework, everything is political. And US foreign policy, once upon a time, it might have brought a bipartisan approach, but now it just brings a purely partisan approach. And you can be sure that if Joe Biden is seen as somehow weak, Donald Trump is going to pounce on it. Yeah, it's so interesting, isn't it? The question of the Russia-Hamas link, because I um, talked to somebody who's very well connected on these issues about two months ago and I said you know is there anything to the Russia Hamas link and they said in a word no in two words definitely no so they were very keen to separate out if you like you know US enemies into different groups when you hear it through Ambassador Hurst's lines I think it's interesting isn't it I mean it's not you know he called a failure to see it that way as naive and I think it becomes probably easier for America if you think that Russia and Iran and China are all part of the same axis of intent because in a way that gives you the grounds for America to do whatever it needs to do. We will be back after the break and again a little corner turn we're going to be talking about vaping rather than World War Three. Yeah. So the big news that came last night when the embargo was lifted was that the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, is vowing to push ahead with a ban on disposable vapes and a ban on smoking, saying that it's right to do for our children what we all know is right. It is an almost incontestable piece of legislation he's introducing. He has the support of Labour. He has the support of Lib Dems. I think he's got the support of the SNP. But of course, when I say almost incontestable, (laughs) there is a corner of France which shall never give up and be vanquished by the Conservatives. And that is the Gaulois little bit (laughs) of Liz Truss. (laughs) Liz Truss and her merry band who want to fight the Prime Minister on this because she says what he's doing is anti-conservative. She doesn't like a ban, even if it stops the next generation from getting lung cancer. So the debate is not as it was in the US in the 1960s about whether smoking is bad for you and whether there was any relationship between tobacco products and cancer. No, we've gone past that now. We do accept that that has been clearly proven. It is the right of the big state to tell people what to do. And Liz Truss, after her 
I don't know what the word is to describe it. After her premiership, let's just say a premiership and not use any adjectives either side of it. Uh, after that premiership of 49 days, um, she has now made herself the absolute champion of civil liberties, the libertarian right of the Conservative Party, that just the state must stop telling people what to do. And it's the same about food and obesity she doesn't think that people that you know the state has any role in telling people what food they need to eat what's bad for them people should make their own minds up and vaping which we don't have detailed data on about whether it is bad for your health but what we do seem to know is one its usage has gone up dramatically with those brightly colored packets and two you're getting a taste for nicotine and we know that nicotine is highly addictive um, and people find it very very hard to quit after years and years and years of trying. I quite enjoy this debate actually. I because thought you were say I quite enjoy vaping. Sorry. <laughs> I've never vaped. I wouldn't know one end of a vape from another. I mean you probably learn that quite quickly but I I like the fact that this is an ideological debate. It's exactly the sort of debate I sort of feel that the Conservative Party should be having. And I also feel that Liz Truss is the one person who should be pioneering um, sort of the freedom of choice because that is that is what she does. That's what her T-shirt says. You know, she's, she's with all these sort of American freedom sort of caucuses now. She's a big believer in small state. And so I quite like the fact that she is taking Rishi Sunak on and I guess that Rishi Sunak probably quite like the fact that his one sort of adversary in all this is none other than Liz Truss, who he, he, he doesn't really face a big threat from in any other way. But I think what we might see starting to happen is other people joining, as it were, the Truss bandwagon, not because they have a problem ideologically with, with his brand of conservatism, but purely because it becomes another anti-Rishi stick. It becomes a stick with which to beat Rishi Sunak. And one person has quoted in the Times as saying, this is redolent of the disastrous conference speech. I'm sure banning vapes goes down brilliantly amongst the Californian fasting community, but our voters want the boat stopping and their wage packets growing. Now, he's not exactly calling Rishi Sunak woke, but he almost is. He's talking about Rishi and his Californian lifestyle, you know, in brackets, he's too rich. Fasting, well, we know that that's something he does as part of his religion, Hindu. So what is the implication of pointing out it's with the fasting community? When you go on to say, are boats stopping and their wage packets growing? There is just the hint that this conservative, that this MP doesn't really like the kind of leadership Rishi Sunak is standing for anymore because it's about rich people who can choose what they want as opposed to the, the salt of the earth people who want to stop the boats. The funny thing is that I would say that Rishi Sunak is much more centred where the traditional centre of gravity has been in the Conservative Party. He is very recognisable to generations who've gone before. He is not to the libertarians. Right. And, you know, Rishi Sunak believing that we should take an interest in what kids are consuming, cigarettes or not, vaping or not, uh, eating healthily or not, is something that, you know, is very much part of the paternalistic style of conservatism that Britain has historically had. I mean, you know, we were talking last week on the podcast uh, about what was happening in New Hampshire, where the first primary had taken place. The slogan of New Hampshire is live free or die. There are no crash helmet laws in New Hampshire. You yeah. do not have to wear a crash helmet. We have established in this country laws on seat belts in cars, on pe people wearing crash helmets on motorcycle, and they have been in place for decades. Now, at the time, they were seen as a terrible infringement of civil liberties. Is there a serious voice anywhere that says that that should be overturned. So if Rishi Sunak is being criticised from this kind of libertarian right, I don't think he's got much to worry yeah. about, to be honest. I also think it is the answer to everyone saying, where is Sunak's vision? Because please, God, let it not be a vision about ending small boats. You know, you do not want to go down in flames as the prime minister who lost an election because he bet his farm on stopping small boats and the small boats carried on. Or even if they stopped, nobody will actually remember 
what he ever stood for. I think this vision of actually trying to wipe out smoking for an entire new generation, you might hate it, but actually it is a vision and it is bold and he's pursuing it despite the fact that the very country where he got the idea from, New Zealand, has changed its mind. And so I think it does become a proper answer. If your mum turned round or your wife turned round and said, sorry, darling, what did you actually do as Prime Minister? If you can point to that, that is actually a pretty big step. It's something that is yours. But I do think that in the bigger picture of Rishi Sunak, to use your metaphor, he has bet the farm. He has bet the entire farm on stopping the boats. And if it was just a small part of a much wider policy, it would have been much, much more sensible. That's not to say the smoking idea is wrong or crazy. It's probably not. But it's not it's not going to be anything like as central to his campaigning as the boats is come the general election. I guess the irony is because it will get the support of pretty much the rest of Parliament, it will go through, fantastic, it will be passed, but less noise will be made about it as a result. Exactly. We'll be back after the break. Emily and I are obviously still smarting from coming away empty-handed from, you know, Boris Johnson's and then Liz Truss's resignation honours list, when we've been so deserving, I think, of a medium-sized gong, not a huge one, but a medium-sized gong at the very least. Actually, those resignation honours list caused, rightly, in my humble opinion, an absolute furore. About... Your opinions are never humble. Oh, aren't they? No. I thought I was terribly humble. No. Ever, ever so, ever so humble. <laughs> Tell him, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> well, in my arrogant opinion I thought they were a bloody outrage uh, particularly the Liz Trust ones but even the Boris Johnson ones too so there yeah and now an independent committee is going to bring back the findings of its report on Thursday into whether or not the Prime Minister should have that power be that voice of last resort to decide who does and does not get an honour is it going to spoil everything if I say they think things should change. And they'll probably remain the same. And we will be coming back to this subject again and again, all the time. I won't be Lord overbearing and you won't be Baroness softly spoken. (laughs) We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Bye. The News Agents. This is a Global Player original podcast.